From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, some facts and some myths about exercise. Is sitting the new smoking? Does running ruin your knees? We'll talk with Daniel Lieberman. He's a professor in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard. He says, we never evolved to exercise. Nevertheless, we should do it. In his lab at Harvard, he studies the biomechanics and physiology that underlie various exercises and activities. He's also spent time in remote villages in Africa and Latin America with indigenous people who are hunter-gatherers. Lieberman researches how much time they spend walking, running, carrying, and sitting, and how their health and longevity compares with that of Americans. Lieberman has written a new book called Exercise. Later, jazz critic Kevin Whitehead reviews the new album by soprano saxophonist Jane Ira Bloom and bassist Mark Elias. Support for this podcast comes from the Neubauer Family Foundation, supporting WHYY's Fresh Air and its commitment to sharing ideas and encouraging meaningful conversation. The restrictions caused by the pandemic have changed the amount of time many of us spend moving, walking, standing. If you're used to going to work, but have spent the better part of the year at home, and you can't go to the gym because it's closed, or you just don't feel safe doing it, or you don't even have time to take a walk because you're working, and have children at home all day because their schools are closed, well, how's that affecting your body and your general health and your mental outlook? My guest, Daniel Lieberman, writes about the importance of exercise and the myths surrounding it in his new book, exercised, why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. Some of the questions he addresses include, is sitting the new smoking? Is it bad to slouch? Do you really need eight hours of sleep? Is walking effective for losing weight? Does running ruin your knees? He writes from his perspective as a paleoanthropologist. He's a professor in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard. In his lab at Harvard, he and his students conduct experiments to study the anatomy, biomechanics, and physiology that underlie various exercises and activities. His research has led him to remote villages in Africa and Latin America that have not been industrialized. He studied how much time indigenous people there sit, sleep, walk, forage, dance, and run. He's compared their activities, their bodies, their health and longevity to that of Americans. Daniel Lieberman, welcome back to Fresh Air. Thank you for joining us. So during COVID, I feel like everybody's lives has changed in one way or another. So I'm going to mention a couple of things about my life. I typically, for many years, have worked at the radio station. During COVID, I've been working from home. Simple things that are causing me to take fewer steps in my working life, the bathroom was further away in the office than it is in my small home. (laughs) I'd walk every day a few blocks to get lunch and then walk a few blocks back to get it home. I'm not doing that now. I'm just making something really quickly for myself. However, I'm still taking walks and I'm spending more time making meals because I can't eat out. And I'm spending more time, therefore, washing dishes since I eat three meals at home now instead of none or two since I'm not in the office or eating out. So my first question is, can I count standing and cooking and washing dishes and cleaning as exercise? Well, that's a great question. First of all, I should mention that my step count has also gone down by about 50% for all the same reasons. Well, I think it's important to make a distinction between physical activity, which is just moving, right? Including making you know, breakfast and lunch and going to the bathroom and all those sorts of things. And exercise, which is physical activity that's sort of discretionary and voluntary for the sake of health and fitness. And, um, and so um, what the pandemic has done for a lot of, almost all of us, is to decrease our physical activity, right? I'm not going to work either. I'm working from home. I'm, uh, you know, not making as many trips to, you know, to do errands. All those kinds of things are really kind of cutting down on how much I'm, I'm sort of walking about. Um, but I'm trying to compensate with exercise, but that's also been challenging. And so the end result is that um, uh, my, my overall physical activity levels have definitely decreased, r- regardless of my attempts to compensate with exercise. So not all physical activity is exercise. Exercise is a, a special kind of physical activity. Okay, so you're saying that I can't count washing dishes and washing the floors and um, standing up preparing food instead of sitting 
eating at a restaurant that I can't count that as exercise, but I can count that as some form of physical activity, right? Yeah. Yeah. For those of us in that position where we're doing more housework and we're doing more cooking and washing dishes, that's still physically better than just sitting. And, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. No, phys- it's what matters is physical activity. It's just that we've, we've created a world in which we don't have to do much work anymore, right? We don't have to be very physically active. And so today, uh, people do something very strange, which is they, you know, they, they go on a treadmill or they you know, go for a, a five-mile run in the morning for the sake of just the five-mile run, or, they, or they, they lift weights whose sole purpose is to be lifted. That, that's, um, that's exercise, and, and that's a very modern behavior. People never did that before because until recently, people had to be uh, much more physically active every day in order to get food or, or sometimes to avoid being somebody else's food. There's a great story you tell in your book you met, just mentioned treadmills, um, and this story has to do with a treadmill. Like I said, you go, done a lot of studying in remote villages where people are still basically foraging and hunting for food, and you're comparing their physical activity with ours and their bodies with ours. So in a remote village in Kenya, you managed to transport there a treadmill. <laughs> what was your point in bringing a treadmill to this village? <laughs> Well, so yeah, we've been we've been working in a community up in the in the up at the top of the Western Rift Valley in, in Kenya for, for almost uh, twelve years now, and um, the, the the community has no uh, paved roads. There's no electricity. There's no running water, and people do everything by hand. Everything, and um, one of the things that people do is they carry everything. They carry. Uh, especially women. Women carry a lot of firewood. Women carry huge uh, sort of jerry cans of water, often long distances up hills. And uh, we are interested in how uh, people carry because there's we have some evidence that uh, people can carry women can carry you know huge weights like twenty percent of their body mass um, on their heads with no essentially no extra cost. And we were curious how they did that. So we we have some fancy machines that measure oxygen, so we could measure how much energy they're spending. And we thought the best way to do this would be on a treadmill. So we we bought a treadmill and schlepped it up these horrible roads to get it to this area, and we found the closest place where we could plug it in. And then we drove our, our, our um, we got our, you know, with a Jeep, we got our participants uh, to the treadmill. And it was a total disaster because if you've never been on a, if, you, if you're a 40, 50 year old person and you've never been on a treadmill your entire life, <laughs> it's a very strange and awkward experience. And, and, and the women, uh, they got a kick out of it. They sort of enjoyed the treadmill, but they weren't walking normally the way they normally walk because it's such a strange, bizarre flummoxing contraption. And so we actually had to, after all that time and energy and effort uh, to get the treadmill up there, we had to abandon using the treadmill instead, uh, did the experiment uh, outside over, over ground. Was your conclusion that we walk differently on a treadmill than we do if we're walking on a floor or the street? Well, yes. I mean, everybody does walk slightly differently on a treadmill and, and also we run slightly differently. But, but, but more importantly, um, it's just that we wanted to make sure people were walking the same way they normally walk when they're carrying things. And, you know, you change how you walk. And, um, and if you're not used to a treadmill, um, you know, it's, um, you walk very awkwardly. Um, um, it's kind of a, you know, it's a bizarre experience to kind of walk and, and, and not get anywhere. I've always wondered, like, is there more tension in your body when you're walking on a treadmill because, because it's slightly unnatural and also because your brain always knows that you have to walk in place at the speed of the treadmill and it's a kind of narrow area. Absolutely. I mean, I find, I, I you know, I, I put people on treadmills for a living and I sometimes use a treadmill to exercise, but I, I, um, I find them... Uh, un- unpleasant, and I, um, you know, for me to go on a treadmill, I need to, I need to listen to a podcast or or something to keep it from being too monotonous. And you know, there's, you know, you're often in, you're usually you're indoors, so you're not getting any fresh air, um, and it's just not a, it's not a great experience. It's, it's kind of like you know, taking cod liver oil. I mean, it's just for most people, treadmills aren't that much fun, and and I found it kind of interesting and and uh, and uh, and sort of deliciously ironic that that the sort of modern treadmill was invented. Uh, in the Victorian period to um, to torture prisoners. Uh, so Oscar Wilde, for example, was condemned to tread on a, you know, trudge on a treadmill for like five, six hours a day to prevent him from enjoying himself. He probably had great lower body strength, though, after that. Yeah. <laughs> Good cardio. <laughs> um, one of the themes of your book is that we never evolved to exercise, but right nowadays we need to exercise. Um, 
And you're right. You've, you've said insufficient regular exercise is abnormal and pathological. So let's start with how can you say that we didn't evolve to exercise? What do you mean by that? Well, exercise is discretionary, planned, voluntary physical activity for the sake of health and fitness, right? It's like what I did this morning. I went for a, for a five-mile run, right? For, oh, solely for the sake of the fact that it, it, it's good for my health and both mental as well as physical. Um, but uh, in the past, nobody did that. Uh, in the past, people every day went, were physically active. They would go out and, and walk or sometimes run and dig things and carry things and do all kinds of other activities that, uh, that were necessary to get food. But, but they struggled to get enough energy, um, and they were already pretty physically active. And so spending extra energy to do something that had no benefit is actually a problem, right? It's a cost. It uh, takes a, a energy away from, from, from other functions that are important, like taking care of your body or, or, or reproducing. So, so until recently, uh, when energy was limited and people were physically active, you know, doing, doing physical activity that wasn't necessary or rewarding uh, just didn't happen. Um, I, when I go to these villages, I'm the only person who gets up in the morning and goes for a run, and often they laugh at me. They think I'm just absolutely bizarre. Um, they think it's pretty funny. Um, you know, why would anybody do something like that? So uh, another reason why, why you say we haven't evolved to exercise is that we evolved to conserve calories because we evolved to do the hunting and gathering and taking care of children and all that, and then to conserve calories after that because there might not be enough food. Hmm. And so expand on that, if you would. Yeah, so humans are incredibly energetically expensive creature. Um, we, we, we are very energetically intense. We, we, we spend a lot of energy on our bodies, um, and, but we also struggle to get all that energy um, because we... Um, you know, we, we, we have an energetically intensive uh, reproductive strategy. We have an energetically intensive um, physical activity strategy. You know, we spend a lot of energy. Here, here's an interesting fact. The average sedentary American is still more active than a typical wild chimpanzee. Um, you know, chimpanzees uh, will walk a few miles a day, two to three miles a day. But even a sedentary American uh, does, a, does a, about that or a little bit more. Because chimpanzees spend most of their time just eating. They just put food in their mouth and mostly rest. Um, we also, and, but we not only spend a lot of energy just going around doing things, but also we have a very energetically intensive reproductive strategy. Humans, um, we have uh, babies at twice the rate as our cousins, the chimpanzees. We spend a lot longer growing up, so we have to invest more energy in, in, in growing our bodies, and, and, and the list goes on. So, so until recently, people struggle to get enough food. Um, but they have a very energetically intensive strategy. And so when that occurs, you have trade-offs, right? You can't, you know, every time you spend energy on one thing, you can't spend it on something else. And so energy spent on, on unnecessary physical activity um, was detrimental. So, so we evolved to spend energy when it was necessary or rewarding. And, and otherwise, it makes sense to, um, to take it easy. So, so you know, when, when people aren't working in... in, in um, in, in you know non-Western, non-industrial um, uh, environments, they're tending, they tend to rest and take it easy and, and not uh, spend unnecessary calories unless there, there's some benefit, like dancing, for example, which is obviously very beneficial for social reasons and, and, and mental health reasons. And, and, and for play, play is obviously very important. Uh, but other than that, they, they take it easy. So you're right that we, we, we really didn't evolve to exercise. Because the way humans evolved, we were conserving our energy to forage for food and to hunt and raise children. We also didn't evolve to sit in chairs all day. So a question you ask in your book, and I want to ask you your thoughts about this, is are our chairs killing us? Is it true, <laughs> is it true that sitting is the new smoking, that sitting for long periods is as damaging as smoking is? Well, I decided to start the book with a discussion about physical inactivity. Because if you want to understand physical activity, we also have to understand inactivity, which is what we actually spend most of the time doing. Um, whether, you're a, whether you're a modern, you know, a desk chair bound um, uh, professor like me or, or a hunter gatherer or a subsistence farmer. And, um, and recently we've sort of demonized sitting, right? Sitting is the new smoking and you can p regularly pick up the newspaper or click on websites which tell you that, you know, if every hour you sit, two hours of your life walk away, you know, and, and there's all kinds of scary statistics about sitting. So I was curious about that. And um, because one of my experiences are that when I walk into a village um, in, uh, in, 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 a, in a remote part of the world um, where people don't have chairs or, if I, or like, you know, hunter-gatherer camp, 
uh, people are always sitting. And uh, it turns out, so uh, some uh, friends and colleagues of mine actually put some accelerometers on some hunter-gatherers and found that they sit on average about 10 hours a day, which is pretty much the same amount of time Americans like me spend sitting. Um, so it turns out that I think we've um, we kind of demonized sitting a little falsely. Um, it's, it's not unnatural or strange or weird or, uh, you know, to sit all the time or sit a lot, but it is, it is problematic if, of course, that's all you do. And, and as I started to explore the literature more, I was fascinated because uh, most of the data that associates uh, sitting a lot with poor health outcomes uh, turns out to be a leisure time sitting. So if you look at how much time people spend sitting at work, uh, it's not really that associated with, with heart disease or, or, or cancers or diabetes. But if you look at how much people sit uh, when they're not at work, well, then, then the numbers get a little bit scary. So some people say that if you sit too long, too frequently, that it can harm your immune system. It could trigger your immune system and create inflammation. Do you think that's true? And if so, what is the connection between sitting and inflammation? Well, it turns out that what that is true that um, sitting too much does uh, lead to uh, with chronic inflammation. But but it turns out that there there are two factors. The first is that it's it's really leisure time sitting, which is mostly associated with that, and that's um, that because that means if you because if you sit at work and then you go home and you sit all the time as well, that means you're probably not getting any physical activity, which means you're probably gaining weight, which which and and and, and gaining weight uh, is associated with with higher levels of inflammation. But the other thing that's really fascinating is that just getting up every once in a while, every few, every you know, 10 minutes or so, just to you know, go to the bathroom or pet your dog or make yourself a cup of tea, you don't, even though you're not spending a lot of energy, you're turning on your muscles. And your muscles, of course, are the largest organ in your body. And, they're, and, they're, and, and just turning them on uh, turns down inflammation. It uses up uh, fats in your bloodstream and sugars in your bloodstream, and it produces um, molecules that, that turn down inflammation. So the evidence is that interrupted sitting is, is really uh, the best way to sit. So if, you know, in, in, in hunter-gatherer camps, you know, people are getting up every, every few minutes you know, to take care of the, the fire or take care of a kid or something like that. And that kind of interrupted sitting, as well as sitting in which you're not sitting in a chair that's kind of nestling your body and preventing you from using any muscles, all that kind of keeps your muscles going and turns out to be a much healthier way to sit. So you challenged the uh, common idea that back support is really good when we're sitting in chairs. And we've established we all sit in chairs a lot, or at least many of us, myself included, sit in chairs a lot for myself, like way too much of the time. So why do you think back support is not necessarily essential and may actually be counterproductive? Well, when you're sitting in a chair with a back, with a seat back, um, just, you know, we all think that's normal for a chair to have a seat back, but until recently, only, you know, really rich people, you know, like the Pope or the King had a chair with a seat back. Until recently, all human beings pretty much either sat on the ground, or if they did have chairs, they were stools or benches or things like that. I mean, if you were, even if you were courtier in the, in the court of, you know, the King back in the, you know, 15th century, unless you were really high up, you would be sitting on a bench or a stool. And the reason it matters for our health is that a seat back uh, essentially makes sitting even more passive than, than, um, than, than, um, than just sitting on a bench or a stool because you're, you, you, lean against the, you lean against the seat back and, and you're using even, even fewer muscles, even less effort to stabilize your upper body. And, and the result is that we end up having very weak backs. Uh, so um, our, you know, there are a lot of muscles that we use in our backs to, to hold up our upper body. And um, if those muscles, if we don't use them, just like every other muscle in your body, they atrophy, and, and weak muscles then uh, make us more prone to back pain. And in fact, uh, studies show that the, most, the best predictor of whether or not somebody ha- gets lower back pain, and, and most of us do get lower back pain, is whether or not we have uh, weak and, importantly, fatigable backs. And, and I think back, you know, sitting a lot on chairs with, with backrests uh, contributes to that. You say that there's actually no good evidence that slouching causes back pain. Yeah, I think this is an example of where we have confused cause and effect. And I was really fascinated by this because as I started looking into the literature about slouching, uh, because, you know, the idea that we shouldn't slouch uh, really began in the 19th century with uh, German orthopedics um, who, who were, who, you know, the, 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 the common chair that we have, the chair with a back, only became 
um, became available to people during the Industrial Revolution. In fact, uh, it was not till the 1850s that, you know, that cafe chair, that kind of what we see everywhere in cafes and all over the place, that was the first mass-produced industrial chair with a back. And it wasn't in, before that, that that many people, you know, who, were, who weren't wealthy had, had chairs with, with backs available to them. And when that happened, uh, you know, German anatomists and others were, you know, Victorians were, were, were kind of appalled by, by all the sitting that people were doing. And, and, and it was just opined that you ought to sit in the same way that you stand, you, that your posture should be the same. And there was no evidence actually to support that. And uh, today, even today, people are, you know, if, if, if you're slouching, somebody will tell you to stop slouching, it's not good for you. And, and what the evidence tells us actually is that that if you have a weak back, you're more prone to slouching. But it's not the slouching itself that causes the back pain. It's actually the weak back. So, so you're, the tendency to slouch is really more of a marker of your, 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 the fact that you don't have a particularly strong back rather than the cause of the back pain itself. So we've, we've confused cause with effect. If you're just joining us, my guest is Daniel Lieberman, author of the new book, Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. He's a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard. We'll be back after we take a short break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Dr. Anthony Fauci will receive WHYY's 2021 Lifelong Learning Award Wednesday, February 3rd, and we're inviting you to be part of this special evening, featuring a live interview of Dr. Fauci by Terry Gross, host and co-executive producer of Fresh Air. Proceeds from ticket sales to this virtual event support WHYY's commitment to lifelong learning and civic engagement through storytelling, education, and community conversations. Get yours today at whyy.org slash lifelong learning. Let's get back to my interview with Daniel Lieberman, author of the new book, Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. He's a paleoanthropologist and a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard. He studied why humans did not evolve to want to exercise, but why exercise is nevertheless important for good health and well-being. In his lab at Harvard, he conducts experiments to study the anatomy, biomechanics, and physiology of movement and exercise. His research has also taken him to the Arctic, Africa, and Latin America to study the activities of indigenous people in remote villages with no electricity or running water, to study their physical activities and see how their bodies compare to ours. His research has led him to challenge a lot of myths about exercising. Let's move on to running. And you asked the question, is it true that running is bad for your knees? What does the research have to say? Yeah, there's you know there's there's this kind of general idea out there that, that that running is like you know driving your car too much. It's like it's wear and tear, right? And that running is highly stressful and it and just wears away your cartilage, just like driving your car for a long period of time, you know, wears out your your your, your springs, for example. And um, that turns out not to be true. <laughs> um, study after study has shown that in terms of wear, which which by which we merely mean arthritis, right, degeneration of the cartilage in your joints, that, that people who run more do, are not more likely to get arthritis in their knees. In fact, they're actually slightly less likely to get arthritis because the, 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 the you know, using your cartilage, uh, using your joints, using your muscles, strength, all the good benefits from physical activity actually turn out to be slightly uh, protective. Uh, that said, um, it's also true that the most common site of injury for for, ru- for runners is their knees. Uh, but a lot of those injuries, I think, are preventable by learning to run properly. And I think, you know, we don't treat running as a skill in our culture. Um, we just, you know, give people shoes and tell, tell them to head out the door. And, and some people run really well, and some people don't run that well, and, or they're not really well, ad- you know, ad- their bodies aren't really well adapted to running, and then they, and then they get into trouble. But, but in terms of wear and tear, I think we can dispel that myth completely. You went to uh, a foot race of indigenous people who were famous for their running in Mexico. Tell us about the people in the race. Oh, so uh, I've had the chance to do field work with the Tara Humara who live in, they call themselves the Raramuri, uh, who live in Northern Mexico. And they're, they're, they're a Native American uh, a group that, that's among other things, very famous for their running. And they have, um, they have these beautiful races. Uh, there's a woman's race called the Arahuete, where women, uh, it's often about a 25 mile race where women flick this kind of, uh, uh, cloth loop with a stick and then they chase it and they flick it again and they chase it. And the men have a race that's sort of similar but with a ball, like a wooden ball, which they kick and then they chase and then they kick and then they chase and there are two teams. And 
Um, and it turns out that that race uh, is a, those races are a form of prayer. Uh, they're they're a way of of of, of uh, honoring uh, their God, and um, of, and it's a sort of a, for them a, a, a spiritual event, and it's a it's um, a absolutely wonderful, beautiful uh, example of the kinds of running traditions that used to be omnipresent uh, throughout the the New World. Um, pretty much every Native American group we know of had uh, had had running traditions that often had sort of spiritual. Uh, important spiritual and social overtones. They're also a time for people to get together. People bet on the on the races, so there's there's money exchanged or or you know, corn and clothes and and other goods. Uh, it's just a wonderful, joyous, uh, delightful experience. Does everybody participate in the running, or is it only like the really really good runners? So only the really good runners do the whole thing. So um, so there, there are teams of usually about five individuals on, e- on each team, both for the men's and the women's races. Um, and they're the ones who, 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 who stick it out through the whole race. Um, but, but what's fun is that um, during the race, uh, they're often on these kind of loops, right? Sort of like a five kilometer sort of there and back kind of loop. Um, uh, people will, um, will just join in. Uh, you know, every, anybody who wants to, and you, and you and you follow behind the runners, and and you and you shout and cheer things, and I've I've done this on on numerous occasions, and 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 had a blast. Um, and people will run you know, a few miles with the runners, and and um, so it's a very communal event. But but only, you know, we have this idea. I call it the myth of the athletic savage. That you know, people who are uncontaminated by civilization are just these incredible endurance runners, and they can do it easily. I can tell you. It's hard for these runners, just like it would be hard for us, right? They they struggle. They have nausea. They have cramps. It's really challenging for them, um, and they need support and help. And they have their own form of Gatorade, and and um, but um, but it it they do it because it's 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 meaningful for them, and it's and it's important to them, even though it is challenging. Just like it's challenging for for ultra runners to do you know hundred mile races in the United States. That it they're, you know, humans are humans, no matter where they are. Let's talk about muscle atrophy. Because that's part of the problem. Like if you don't exercise, you literally lose muscle strength. The muscles stop working. What happens when muscles atrophy, and why do they atrophy? Yeah, I think one of the most important points about physical activity is that as we age, it's it becomes m- not less but more important to be physically active. And, and muscle atrophy is the perfect example. So you know we have this sort of notion that as you get older, you you know go to re- you retire, you go to Florida, you kick your feet up on the on the beach, or you know whatever. But, um, but what happens is that when you do that, um, and, we, and we have plenty of evidence that, that older individuals in America are less physically active and they do less, uh, fewer activities that involve strength. And, and one of the, the really sort of serious negative consequences of that is that our muscles dwindle, they atrophy. Uh, there's, a, there's a technical term for that, which I think is illuminating. It's called sarcopenia. Sarco means flesh in Greek, and penia means loss, so it's flesh loss. But basically it's frailty. And, and as we get older and become more frail, a vicious circle sets in because, um, because we, you know, we walk more slowly, it's harder to get out of a chair, and that makes us even less likely to be physically active, which keeps that cycle going. So that's the bad news. But uh, the good news is that um, it doesn't take a huge amount of physical activity to kind of reverse that, turn it around. I mean, think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who you know, she was celebrated for her, 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 um, her vim and vigor, which, and that, a lot of that came from the fact that she kept working out, um, and, and all, as she got older, she went to the gym several times a week and, you know, she didn't crazy pump iron stuff. She didn't, you know, wasn't trying to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but she did, you know, you know, a few, a few rounds of uh, weight training every, uh, 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 every week. And, and, and that helped keep her, you know, marvelously active and vigorous up until her late eighties. And, and and the the mechanisms that get turned on when we when we do a little bit of strength training um, uh, don't diminish with age. So if you're in your 80s or your 90s and you do a little bit of you do a little strength training, you'll still get enormous benefits. Let me reintroduce you here. If you're just joining us, my guest is Daniel Lieberman, and he's the author of the new book Exercised: Why Something We Never Evolved to Do Is Healthy and Rewarding. We'll be right back after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Hint, fruit-infused water with no calories or sweeteners. Hint water comes in over 25 flavors. The watermelon water actually tastes like watermelon. The blackberry water tastes like blackberries. Hint is water with a touch of true fruit flavor. You can get Hint water at stores, or you can have it delivered directly to your door. 
When you buy two cases, you'll get a third case free and free shipping. Visit drinkhint.com and use promo code NPR at checkout. This is Fresh Air, and if you're just joining us, my guest is Daniel Lieberman, author of the new book, Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. And he writes about the importance of exercise and myths surrounding it. He's a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard. One of the issues that we face now is that we're living longer, but more people are suffering from chronic long-term diseases. Living with them or dying as a result of these chronic long-term diseases. A good example of that is diabetes. And you write about how our sweet tooth evolved and how that's contributed to diabetes. So how did our sweet tooth evolve? Well, we evolved to to, to, get, to want energy. I mean, the, the basic equation of life, if you want to be really reductionist about it, is, you know, energy in and babies out, right? That's what we evolved to do. And, <laughs> and any way to get, get, get more energy is good. And any way to spend less energy is also good because it enables you to have more babies, which is sadly the only thing natural selection cares about, right? So, so we evolved to love sweet things. Um, it turns out the favorite food of hunter-gatherers in Africa, uh, and we were, uh, at some point, all our ancestors were hunter-gatherers in Africa. Uh, but if you ask hunter-gatherers in Africa what they like the most, they'll tell you it's honey, right? And I've, been, I've gone on you know, hunting trips with, with hunters in, in Tanzania, and, and, and they often end up being honey-collecting trips, and they go from hive to hive to hive and just eat unbelievable quantities of honey that would make, you know, any dentist gasp, right? But, um, but, but because we love sweet things. And, 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 and sweet things, of course, if you're physically inactive, cause you to add weight, right? And when you get, um, when you add fat, especially in, in, your, in your abdomen, you get, you know, belly fat, or what's called visceral fat. That fat is very inflammatory, turns on your immune system at this kind of slow burn, and that leads to diseases like diabetes. And so one of the just enormous basic fundamental benefits of physical activity is it counters that obesity, it counters that inflammation. The, the major um, tissues that produce the anti-inflammatory molecules that keep us from being inflamed are muscles. So when you exercise, your muscles are producing all these molecules, they're called myokines, that actually turn down inflammation and keep us healthy, preventing us from getting diabetes, prevent us from getting cancer, prevent us from getting Alzheimer's, prevent us from getting atherosclerosis, you know, hardening of the arteries, prevent us, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's extraordinary how many benefits you get just from moderate levels of physical activity, just turning on your muscles. In, in terms of getting diabetes, is there a difference between honey and sugar? And in terms of inflammation in general in your body? Not really. I mean, I think we, we talk, we think so much about, nutri you, know, you know, whether it's, you know, high fructose corn syrup or sucrose or whatever. I mean, sugar is sugar, basically. I mean, there are different kinds. Um, uh, and some sugars, um, uh, fructose, for example, are handled more by your liver and some are, are handled more by insulin. Um, but the bottom line is if you eat a lot of sugar, no matter whatever kind of sugar it is, you're going to, um, you're going to add weight. And when you're, and when you add weight, when you add fat, each, each cell, you don't add cells, you, the cells just swell. And as those cells swell, they, they become like, like broken balloons. They start to, they start to mi misfunction. And that, that swelling causes uh, inflammation, so your immune system comes in and starts producing all these, all these molecules to try to kind of deal with the, with, the, with the kind of local injury, and that's what's so pernicious. So it's really about weight gain. So if you eat if, you know, a reasonable amount of, uh, you know, if you're a hunter-gatherer who's eating sugar, but you're also very physically active, um, you're not going to run into the same kind of trouble as if you're an American who's eating a lot of sugar and then, you know, sits in a chair all day long. So the Africans who were hunter-gatherers and were gathering a whole lot of honey and eating it, they were not getting diabetes. There's, if there's any cases of diabetes in, in this population, I've never seen it or heard it. I mean, diabetes, heart disease is just almost unknown in these populations. There's a recent study that was done by some colleagues, uh, uh, Hilly Kaplan and, and Mike Gervin, on a population in the Amazon called the Chimani. And they actually managed to get a large sample of these folks into CT scanners and measured their hearts and found that... Um, um, they have, even though they eat a lot of carbohydrates in their diet, right, which is basically sugar, um, they have, there's no evidence for even that, there's just no traces of even heart disease developing in older individuals in the society. 
Uh, so, so these really are modern Western diseases that are caused by a combination of, of diet and physical inactivity. Sleep is a problem for a lot of people too. It's hard for a lot of people to fall asleep. It's harder for a lot of people to stay asleep. And it's hard for a lot of people to find enough hours to sleep, especially if the model that you're using is, oh, you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep every night. And it's hard for a lot of people to find eight hours when they can be in bed uninterrupted. What do you think the research has to say about eight hours of sleep being essential? Well, I was astonished by this. So I actually started to study sleep uh, as part of the, writing the book because I was curious about the, you know, we're, we're exhorted all the time to sit less, but then to sleep more. And I was like curious about that. So I started to look into the literature. And, it, and you know, a common story out there, like I learned, and I used to say this to my students, is that, you know, Thomas Edison robbed us of sleep. You know, he, we invented you know, electricity, and now we have iPhones and televisions and all these things that keep us up at night um, and we, that we didn't used to do, right? And, but it turns out that people who live in, in places where there is no electricity and there are no iPhones and there's no TV, it turns out they don't sleep any more than the average American, right? They sleep, I think the, the number is 6.7 to 7.1 hours is on average uh, a, a night. Um, and they often don't nap either, by the way, which is something we're also told. Um, so there's actually, if you look at the data, there's no evidence that people used to sleep people sleep less today than they used to. Um, and furthermore, <laughs> uh, to my astonishment, when you look at big epidemiological data sets where you, you graph how much you sleep on, on, the, on, the, on the horizontal axis and, and your health outcomes on the y-axis, it's a U-shaped curve, and the bottom of that curve is about seven hours. So people who, you know, of course there's a lot of variation. Some people need more, some people need less. But it turns out that people who sleep seven hours a night tend to be healthier on average uh, than people who sleep eight hours a night. And that's even after you factor in that some people might be sick, and because they're sick, they're sleeping more. So I think sleep is another one of those examples of how we, we, we make people exercise, right? We make them stressed and, 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 and you know, uh, about, about what they should be doing, and we, we kind of, uh, there's a lot of virtue signaling going on. And, and you know, if you tell somebody they're not getting enough sleep, and they actually are getting enough sleep, you just make them stressed, psychosocially stressed, that elevates cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone that make, that's, that's about arousal. Cortisol prevents you from sleeping. And so we get into this kind of vicious circle. So, so while it's true that people who don't get enough sleep are, you know, that, that can be a problem, right? You know, getting three, four, maybe five hours of sleep a night can, 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 can be detrimental and, and it's, an, it's an issue. You know, if you're, if you're fine, if you're getting six, seven hours of sleep and you feel fine, I think we should all relax and stop, and stop being so, you know, uncompassionate to each other. You are not by nature an athletic person. And when you were in school, you once hid in the closet during gym. <laughs> <laughs> you say you were always like the last picked on team. So how did exercise become the thing that you study? Yeah, I, I'm still astonished at my the turn in my life. I would never have predicted a, a bunch of years ago that I'd be writing about this stuff. I mean, I, I was the proverbial nerdy kid. I mean, it's a cliche, but yeah, I was picked last for for most teams. I, I, I was ashamed of my body. I was I was I, I felt, you know, deeply insecure about how bad an athlete I was. And um but I got in but my mother was a she was really my hero um, in in this regard because my mother was a professor at the University of Connecticut, and uh, in the late '60s, the university built a fancy gym, and they wouldn't let women use the gym, uh, even though federal funds were used to build it. So she was so mad that she started running in order to liberate the gym, and uh, she couldn't even run a quarter of a mile at first, but that got her hooked, and she eventually became a runner. Um, this is in the late '60s, before the running boom. So, so. Um, I kind of just thought it was normal uh, to run, um, and that you know, my father started running with my mother, and I just kind of imitated them, and I've, I learned that it kind of kept me from being too hyper, um, this kind of form of medicine. So I would go running occasionally, but I wasn't really, you know, a really serious runner, and I didn't really go very far. And it wasn't until I started studying um, the evolution of running, because I was interested in head stabilization, because I was a head guy, I was studying skulls, that I got really interested in this idea that humans evolved to run long distances. And, and we published a paper in Nature in 2004 entitled Born to Run, that I started really upping my running. And then I started getting invited to marathons, and I started running marathons. And, and you know, but I, I'm not a great athlete. If you, looked, if you met me, you would not think I was a great athlete. Um, I, I'm not particularly fast. But but I've discovered that just even normal, ordinary human beings are able to be, you know, extraordinary athletes compared to, to what we think um, um, uh, we we could be. Uh, I'm never going to win a race, um, but um, 
but it's been, it's turned out to be a kind of a wonderful part of my life. But I've also, I think because of my background, you know, because I'm not a jock and I didn't grow up being very athletic, I kind of, I think I have, I understand um, the, the fact that most people don't love exercise and they, and they, and they're sick of exorcists. I call them exorcists, people who nag and brag about exercise. I mean, it's just irritating to have people, you know, tell you, you know, how, how much they run or how much they lift and how much you ought to do it. You know, m- a lot of us recoil uh, from that. And I, and I don't think that that's been particularly helpful. Daniel Lieberman, a pleasure to talk with you again. Thank you so much and stay healthy, stay well. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it too. Daniel Lieberman is a Harvard professor and the author of the new book, Exercised. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Heidi Simon, Teresa Madden, Henry Boldonado, Thea Chaloner, Seth Kelly, and Kayla Lattimore. Our associate producer of digital media is Molly C.V. Nesper. Roberta Shorrock directs the show. I'm Terry Gross. Thank you.